I'll now call the uh, Haywood County Board of Commissioners meeting uh, to order for December the 6th. Uh, if you'll please join me in standing for a Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Pastor Josh Frazier can't be here uh, today. He's celebrating the birth of a new baby, so we'll have a moment of silence instead. Thank you. At this time, I'll open the public hearing for amendments to multiple ordinances per Session Law 2021-138, which decriminalizes violations of certain ordinances. I'll turn it over to County Attorney Frank Queen. The purpose of this public hearing is to hear public comment for the many changes that have been proposed in the general statutes as required by passage by the General Assembly of a general act that decriminalizes certain kinds of local ordinances, requires them to be enforced only by civil means, that is without filing criminal process, and make certain other uh, conforming amendments to uh, to that statute. We've published um, previously and put up on our website the changes that are proposed to the ordinance. Most of them are fairly technical in that, for example, if an ordinance is allowed to have a criminal uh, penalty for its violation, we have to cite the exact criminal statute that's involved, which generally is GS 14-4. That's a, that's a general misdemeanor violation. If the uh, ordinance uh, intends to have a stricter um, either criminal time, that is more than 30 days or more than 60 days incarceration or more than a $50 uh, fine, then the ordinance itself has to recite that. And, and we're allowed to do that, we have to recite it in the ordinance. So uh, those are the general changes that have been made. Um, some of them are, are kind of interesting. Uh, I came across some pretty interesting um, provisions in our county ordinances that nobody asked me about, but if, they, if anybody does, I've got some opinions about the validity of some of our, of our uh, uh, provisions. Some of them have, were passed a long time ago, and, and they had good intentions, I'm sure, and they've kind of been overtaken by events or law. Uh, and so, so some of these ordinances, it gave me an occasion to have some suggestions probably for us next year about looking into our ordinances and, and, and making a kind of a comprehensive review. It's tedious as all get out to go into these things because every one of them has a subject matter that's very important to people locally, but they're sometimes they, the ordinances were drawn up at a time and a place in a way that has kind of, time has kind of passed them by, and we need to kind of look at those. So that, that's for next year. For this right here, uh, we just have these uh, uh, changes that have been proposed. Are there anyone who has a, uh, uh, a comment about the proposed changes in the ordinances? If not, then I'll uh, uh, close the public hearing on that subject. Any questions from the commissioners for on any of these subjects? Thank you. Thank you, Frank. <clears throat> At this time, I'd like to uh, open the floor for nominations for uh, chair of the board of commissioners. I'd like to make a motion that Kevin Ansley remain the chair. Second. I'd like to also make a motion we close nominations. Second. 
All, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Ayes have it. All right, Mr. Chairman, congratulations. Turn it over to you. Hey, thank you. Thank you all for the opportunity again. <clears throat> Appreciate that. Okay, I'll uh, open the floor for nominations. I nominate Commissioner Brandon Ainsley as Vice Chair. Second. Excuse me, Brandon Rogers. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you and Commissioner Inslee decide if that was an insult or a, <laughs> <laughs> I'm or a sure compliment. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> and Jennifer seconded it, too. Uh, and I seconded it, yeah. <laughs> Jennifer, we'll talk after. Uh, well, nobody gets the names right here. <laughs> It's been, it's been, mo it's been Monday for me since about 4.30 this morning, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, all in favor of uh, Brandon Rogers as vice chair, say aye. 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 Okay. Thank you all. Did we do that okay, Tracy? Tracy's our clerk. We've got to make sure we do this right. Okay, so our next order of business is our public comment session. I do have three people that have signed up. Our timer's not working right now. So Amy will let you know when your time's up, and if you would just finish your thoughts uh, at that point so we can uh, move on to the next speaker. So our first, I'm just taking these in the order I have, and the first person signed up to speak is Eric Overholtz. And just want to let you know, you have, come on up, Eric. You've got three minutes uh, for uh, public comment, and uh, there's some hand sanitizer if you'd like to use it, or, or wipes if you want to use it. Okay. okay. Welcome. Uh, good morning. My name is Eric Overholtz. I reside at 26 Davis Lane in Waynesville. And this morning I'd like to express my thoughts regarding a speech that was brought before you at the last November 15th meeting. Uh, it was a young lady named Noelle Peterson that spoke, or Patterson that spoke. And uh, I was quite touched by what she had to say. Um, and Chairman Inslee, uh, you're absolutely correct in uh, talking about pathways and that it has helped many people in our community over the years. Um, but, you know, people like Noelle, but I'd like for all of you to listen uh, again to what she had to say. Pull it up on YouTube November 15th, and you'll understand just why this is a success story. Uh, this is a Christ-centered program that asks attendees if they're willing to make changes to get themselves out of the predicament they're in. There has to be a commitment and a willingness to change. But there are also there are rules that must be followed. There are curfews. There is a time to be back at the center for prayer and for support meetings. There are job tasks assigned throughout the facility and participants work together. There are requirements that participants actively seek employment. All of these things are components of structure. Structure. This is something that low barrier shelters do not offer. Low barrier shelters allow those things, uh, those staying there to continue on with their self-destructive behaviors. There is no curtailment of the continued drug abuse or alcohol abuse. No structure, no purpose, no direction, no pathway towards reintegrating back into society as a productive member. Noelle Pedersen understands this, and this is why she is warning you against supporting low barrier shelters. You've all seen the fruits of what has happened in Asheville, where local politicians there have converted formerly nice hotels into housing for the homeless. Many, of course, uh, are addicts, and predictably, these very places have become crime-infested hellholes, which only serve to exacerbate problems in the surrounding communities. It's time to face facts. Asheville is here. Take a look under some of the bridges in our county. The Russ Avenue Railroad Bridge, the Howe Mill Railroad Bridge near Raccoon Creek. Take a look at all of the trash, the syringes, the environmental hazards that's created there. The fires, four of them four of them this past week in Waynesville alone that can be attributed directly to the homeless vagrants. Do we want to allow, or worse yet, subsidize shelters that will only attract more of this? I think not. Today I'm calling upon the board to actively start formulating plans for how to firmly deal with the homeless vagrancy population at the county level. We don't need any more task force studies, bureaucracy, or theories from social worker academics. We need strong, decisive leadership that's why we elected you. In action, okay, just one more statement. Okay. 
Uh, I don't know what this will look like. It may be the consideration of a countywide ordinance prohibiting low barrier shelters, or it might be a decision simply to stop funding. But I ask you to take action now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next person to sign up to speak is Lisa Overholt. Welcome. Good morning. My name is Lisa Overholtz, 26 Davis Lane, Waynesville. I would like to have a response from the Board of Commissioners as to why it is taking so long to make a decision on building a jail annex to handle our overcrowded and revolving door county jail. Your failure to take action has yielded negative results, and right now what is happening in this county is appalling. All of you know that Haywood County, and especially the town of Waynesville, has gained a reputation amongst the homeless population as an easy touch because of the revolving door, lack of consequence judicial system, fueled greatly by lack of jail space, and a proliferation of nonprofits and liberal churches that constantly give handouts without real accountability or any accountability. There have been reports of truckloads of homeless people being dropped off in frog level. God forbid you ever sanction or fund low barrier sheltering to attract more of the same. Take a look at what has happened this past week. At least four fires in Waynesville alone. Three occurred under bridges where homeless encampments are located and a building that burned down in Hazelwood was in, air, in an area frequented by homeless vagrants as well. Concerned citizens are getting sick and tired of seeing our beautiful county become marred not only by the crime, but also the growing amounts of discarded trash and syringes and abandoned shopping carts wantonly left around by vagrants without a care about our community whatsoever. I don't expect you to have all of the answers, but in areas where you can make a difference, the citizens would like to see you take some type of meaningful action and making plans to fund and begin construction of a jail annex is one of these areas. Jails provide useful services. Aside from protecting the public, there are already operational programs which can be an early step in an inmate's recovery, such as NA and AA. Physical and mental health is available, as many of the homeless are unhealthy. If you care about the well-being of people on the fringes of society, Please don't promote programs or ideas or low barrier shelters which are destructive to them and to the citizens of Haywood County. Mark Pless has found a facility in Raleigh that will take in 25 men and it has a proven success rate. Please talk with him about his findings. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, our next person to sign up to speak is Sherry Morgan. Welcome, Sherry. Hi, I'm Sherry Morgan. Um, a nice young lady who had successfully gone through Pathways spoke at the November 15th commissioners meeting. She explained how following their required guidelines had helped her overcome homelessness. So why would anyone allow low barrier or no real shelters? You didn't answer her question, Kevin Ansley, because you advocate for low barrier shelters and harm reduction, which is on every socialist platform in the nation. If you read People's Action, the Party for Socialism and Liberation, the Democratic Socialist of America and the Bread and Roses Caucus, you'll find low barrier shelters and harm reduction on their platforms. Read People's Action. They're the policy arm for down home and local socialist groups like down home, the WNC Sunrise Movement, Chelsea White's We Are WNC and Her Transform WNC, Asheville Solidarity, the Sierra Club in Asheville, Madison County's Rural Organizing and Alliance, and the Progressive Alliance of Henderson County. They're not Democrat. Republican or independent. They call themselves nonpartisan, but they're the new socialist party. Their platforms say they want the government to own our corporations, our banking system, and our privately owned homes. No police or prisons, felons to vote, and make all drugs legal because they hate capitalism, which is free trade and how America was founded. They want low barrier homeless shelters or no real shelters to bring in transients to lower property values, run off tourists, and for their vote. Citizens of Buncombe County were able to stop the giant low barrier homeless shelter at the Ramada Inn at River Ridge by speaking out at the Buncombe County Commissioner's meeting. The city of Asheville has announced they still plan to build low barrier shelters. 
They've doubled their transient drug addicts and felons and doubled their crime. They use harm reduction to supply needles and crack kits to the transients and drug addicts instead of rehabilitation. Haywood County needs a multiple occupancy ordinance restricting low barrier or no rules homeless shelters. The socialist goal is to destroy towns with a government takeover. So beware of who you vote for in government elections. We have 95 progressive caucus Sunrise members in Congress right now, and Buckham County is already fully under their control. The county commissioners and the uh, city of Asheville, every one of them, Sunrise member, two of them are not. Wake up, Haywood County. They're coming for you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Would anyone else like to address the board this morning? Okay, seeing no one, I'll close the public comment session. We'll move on to constituent concerns. Um, I wanted to mention, I want to recognize, uh, is David, David, you want to? I want to recognize our community and economic development director, David Francis, who's going to introduce Russ Harris as the new executive director for the Southwest Commission. Welcome, Dave. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congratulations on your reappointments. I um, wanted to make sure everybody knew, knew about uh, some changes that had been made over at the Southwest Commission uh, recently. Uh, Russ Harris was appointed as Executive Director of the Southwestern Commission in September after five years of serving as the Director of Community and Economic Development. His main focus for the last three years has been addressing the broadband and housing crisis in the region, and his team has been responsible for bringing over $7 million to the region for expansion of broadband service. When we were reconfiguring our broadband committee and looking for expertise, you know, Russ was the first phone call I made. Um, and I think, you know, his leadership and guidance, you know, to our broadband committee, which he serves on, has been tremendous. Um, his, uh, for uh, Haywood County and our initiatives here has been a, a very big blessing for the county. And I'd like to recognize Russ. Uh, please come up. Congratulations, Russ. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, commissioners. Um, again, my name is Russ Harris. I've met you all before in my previous role and just wanted to come by this morning and reintroduce myself and um, just talk a little bit about what we have going on at the Southwestern Commission right now. Um, we've passed out annual reports from 2020 for you all to look at. Um, our mission at the Southwestern Commission is to improve the quality of life in the region by helping our local governments achieve their goals. And we do that primarily through our three departments, which are community and economic development, workforce development, and our area agency on aging. With community and economic development, we tend to focus on issues that are kind of rising up beyond local level and things that we see in every community. So as David Francis said, right now that's been broadband and housing for the last couple of years. We have partnered with you all um, to start the Southwestern NC Home Consortium. Mm -hmm. Haywood County is the lead entity in that. It's a federal program, so we're about two years into getting it started, but we do plan on funding starting to roll in early 2022. Uh, with broadband, primarily our focus is to help um, private providers. A lot of grant funds can come to internet service providers. We help them by providing grant writing support. So we worked with Skyrunner last year to write their great grant for about $1.2 million. That's bringing new broadband service to about 300 households. In Haywood County, we got word on Friday that an Appalachian Regional Commission grant that we worked with Dr. Porto to write is being funded. That will bring broadband to the um, Brandon Forest community. Um, so we look forward to that, to that project. Um, we also have a revolving loan fund where we can help fund small businesses. We're currently funding a charter bus company in Haywood County, helping them to get started. Uh, you know, broadband and housing have been our big issues for the last couple of years. One we hear now when we start to travel around communities is workforce. Everybody's hurting to find workforce. So our workforce department works through providing training funds for businesses. Uh, they also are able to, they fund our NC Works um, centers to help them provide services. We are working right now on recovery to work projects so that we can work with people who are in active recovery from addiction to help them find work. We're also looking at starting apprenticeship programs and expanding those so that we can engage youth um, younger and get them into career paths and help them out. Um, and then we also, with our area agency on aging, Sarah Jane Melton is our director and she happens to be here this morning. So instead of me trying to speak to what they do in Haywood County, I'm just going to have her talk real quick. Good morning. Um, at the area agency on aging, we work with wonderful collaborative partners here in Haywood County to meet the
for adults and their family caregivers. But just two examples for you this morning. Um, we've been able to, to work with partners to um, provide over $500,000 in services to older adults in Haywood County. Um, two specific are family caregiver. Uh, as you can imagine, during COVID, family caregivers have had struggles, and we've been able to provide um, numerous hours of respite for them, as well as supplemental supplies that they needed. And we were also able, through the Area Agency on Aging, Southwestern Commission, and the other partners across the region, um, to buy um, replacement supplies for your Canton Senior Center located in Canton. And so when that's able to open up, we're, we're ready and able to, to be able to um, outfit that center. Thank you. Thank you. Just one final point. A lot of our support for our organization comes through federal and state dollars, but we help match those funds with dues that are paid by our local government. So we take in from local governments about $157,000 a year. With that, last year we brought in about $10 million to the region. So for every dollar that we're bringing in in dues, uh, we're leveraging that for about another 60 that are coming into the community. And I just want to express my gratitude to Haywood County for your partnership with the Home Consortium um, and just every project that we have going on with you all right now. Any, any questions? All right. Thank you all. No questions, but congratulations. Thank you. Just, just to follow up, you know, um, his long list of accomplishments, uh, Haywood County um, and the folks uh, down at Brandon Forest just received an ARC grant for, uh, uh, for $100,000 to bring broadband to that area. So thanks to Russ's team for that as well, too. So, yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Okay, then next I'd like to uh, recognize and congratulate our finance officer, Christian Owen, who has uh, recently completed and passed her exam to earn a North Carolina certified finance officer. Uh, so we appreciate that. And I know Julie sent you on the right track, and she, she didn't leave us in bad hands. She left us in good hands, Christian. So thank you, and thank you for your efforts. Okay, okay and then third, uh, we have uh, Matthew Hooper here from the North Carolina Forest Service. He's going to give us a little bit of an update on the uh, forest fires that we've, or the dryness, I guess. Thank goodness it was, we're trying to get a little bit of rain today, maybe on Wednesday. Yes, sir. Good morning. Mm. Uh, glad to be speaking with you guys today. Uh, just based on what uh, Mr. Moorhead and the fire marshal's office has uh, asked me to speak about was uh, last Monday, November the 29th, the state did place a statewide burning ban as of 5 o'clock. Uh, that burning ban is uh, initiated by a couple of different factors. It would be the risk, hazards, and capabilities of the state. And uh, although our weather has not been too dry here, I would consider this over the last 12 years of working in Haywood County. This is a pretty average year for us here. But once you move into the eastern part of the state, into the Piedmont, they've really been having trouble uh, containing their fires uh, due to the uh, dryness and their extended drought, which we did not have. <coughs> So with that uh, burn ban being placed on, that gives the state the jurisdiction of everything 100 foot away from the house and past that for an occupied dwelling. And uh, that, that cuts out all burning in that section except for heating uh, or warming and cooking fires. And then there's some, uh, some area in there that we can work with people if they're doing that. Anything within that 100 foot zone refers back to the fire marshal's office. And uh, as soon as we heard that we were going to be having the burn ban, first thing we do is we call the fire marshal's office and we speak with them. Uh, historically, the way that we uh, run the burn ban is, is whenever the state puts the burn ban on, the county does as well. Um, we found out in 2020, which was the first time that the county did not put the burn ban on, the state was kind of driving that because of COVID. They were, didn't want us to be out as much as we could I worked it through the fire marshal's office and they did not implement their burn ban, which is that 100 foot section. Uh, because to me, and especially being familiar with the county, I didn't think that the conditions warranted it. At. Uh, 2020, everybody was kind of handcuffed <coughs> at doing a lot of stuff and they were afraid that people were going to be at home uh, more often. They were going to be doing that burning. But uh, I didn't think that we needed to place any more restrictions on the public than what we already had. So that worked out great for us. Uh, we decided since the conditions were no worse this time, 
uh, what I would consider an average fire season that we would try it again. And uh, over the last week, I would, I would say it's successful. Uh, we've had uh, very few fires once uh, the media gets that information out about the burn ban, uh, whether it be in the fire marshal's jurisdiction or our jurisdiction. Most of those fires succeed. Um, the fires that we have had, our initial attack has been successful. We've been able to catch them very quick and very small. The largest fire that we've had uh, this fall so far has been an acre and a half, and that's just because the fire departments are doing a great job. We're getting there quick, and uh, the conditions uh, are really helpful. We're not having to go into an uh, extended attack, having to do extra mop-up or putting that fire uh, extra efforts into it, so we're not having to suck up those resources that those larger fires to the east are. So, uh, as you can tell, there's rain, hopefully, in the forecast this afternoon. Um, I talked to uh, some of the people that are in uh, higher positions than I am about uh, when they think that the statewide burn ban will uh, be taken away. And uh, as of right now, because of the resource shortage and basically a lot of the Forest Service staff being so young, we don't have as many people to go to these larger fires. So until the middle part of the state and the coastal plain, till they get more significant rain, they'll probably keep that on there. Um, and as soon as it is, we'll, we'll release all the burning permit stuff. But uh, as of right now, it's been a pleasure working with the fire marshal's office. It's been a pleasure working with all of the fire departments. They've all been really receptive to everything that we've uh, recommended. Um, I have uh, great respect for all of them, and hopefully this uh, burn ban will end soon. If you've got any questions, I'll be happy to try to entertain an answer about the burn ban. So. Just, just thank you for your service, and I know all our volunteer fire departments do an excellent job. Like you say, they got there quick and prevented a, a huge fire. So uh, just, just thank you for what you do. No problem. All right, thank you. Thank, thank you, Matt. You. Appreciate you coming out this morning. Okay, and then um, let's see. Brian, where are we at on the jail? You might want to explain why we've not take, undertaken that yet. Sure. We've... Uh, of course, we, we actually had two different architectural firms give presentations to a, a group, uh, and after that, we, we uh, did a contract and did some soil uh, samples, some geotech work. Uh, that's been completed. We're currently working with the railroad uh, because they have a 100-foot right-of-way, and by both designs that were submitted tentatively, uh, our building would encroach in their right-of-way. Uh, so we uh, have a little bit of back and forth with the railroad. Uh, they want to lease uh, the, the county our property because it encroaches in their right of way. And uh, we, we're working with Frank to, to get an agreement where uh, we're not leasing our own property. So things are moving a little bit slower there, but we, a lot of this is just due diligence that we have to go through and didn't see a point in engaging an architect until we get the details ironed out. Okay. But uh, the jail population is, 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 is not good. Uh, the sheriff and I talk uh, two or three times a week about what we're, we're facing, but uh, you know, we're, we're moving in the right direction. It's moving slower than anyone would uh, care, though. Yeah, and I will say, you know, Pathways has been a solution to the jail. Uh, it's really helped us keep the recidivism rate down, sheriff, and the sheriff, he's back there shaking his head yes. So. Uh, I remember when we started Pathways in 2013, there was a need because there was a lot of homeless people that weren't getting any help. And uh, we did, we went ahead and the commissioners, when uh, we contracted with uh, Pathways to do the, the, uh, the Pathway Center where the old prison was. So that worked really well. Uh, we did have opposition to that, but it was a solution. And now we're seeing the fruits of that from the lady that spoke at our last meeting. Um, and there are hundreds of cases like the lady that spoke that, uh, that Pathways has helped. And it's really kept our recidivism rate down. And of course, with population growth, you're going to always, you know, we've kind of gotten to the end of that. So we, we're all looking at adding on to the jail. And, um, and as far as low bear shelters, we, we don't really get into that. I will say that the county, um, there was a low barrier shelter in Maggie Valley during COVID. It worked really well. People uh, gave them a place to stay. Gave them a place to uh, gave them a place to uh, you know kind of get I guess you'd say get their feet under them to where they could 
uh, get a job, and I think some of them actually had gotten into jobs while they were, they were at that, and that only operated for a couple of months. So we had law enforcement presence there, and, the, and it was some structure. That's what happens with low barrier shelters. You've got to have some structure. It's not going to be willy-nilly. Uh, the one that the, Mark Pless has talked about is technically a low barrier shelter in Raleigh. It works really well. It's a faith-based uh, program. And, I'm, uh, and I will say I'm not ashamed to say that I uh, support uh, any effort to help the homeless. I'm a Christian, and my Christianity tells me in Matthew 25, uh, verses 37 through 44, I believe, to, that we need to take care of the homeless. And Jesus said in Matthew 26, 11, that the, that the homeless, or the other, the poor, you'll have with you always. So I take my admission, uh, and sometimes my Christianity conflicts with my Republican Party, and that's, that's a shame. But... Um, I'm going to always err on the side of Christ and on the side of uh, Christianity. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. So um, hopefully uh, we can try to get uh, some solutions for some of the homeless folks that we have. There was a couple of great movies that I've watched lately. I've, we have Amazon Prime, and I've just kind of started to get into that. But there's a movie called uh, Same Kind of Different as Me. It's a Christian movie. Uh, same kind of different as me. And it's about, it, it really helps you understand the homeless people and their challenges, if you will. Uh, a lot of them have mental health issues. Uh, there's another movie that has Robert Downey Jr. in it. It's called The Soloist. Um, he, he, it, and it really shows you that these people have a lot of mental health issues and there's no help out there today for mental health, none whatsoever. Uh, or very little, I shouldn't say none. But uh, we don't have, I know the sheriff was talking about it in one of our meetings about some of the folks need to be institutionalized. Well, we don't have any institutions to institutionalize them in. So they're just out kind of wandering the streets, and, and they really can't function as normal people like we think they can. A lot of them can't. So there's a lot of mental health issues that we need to try to address. But, uh, but we're looking at all those, uh, those issues, but there's no low-barrier shelter that I know of uh, on our, on our uh, radar anytime soon. So... Uh, hopefully uh, those folks can find ways to, uh, to get help. And uh, one thing the low barrier shelters do do, uh, where you have structure and you have law enforcement present, they, it gives them someone to talk to about maybe getting off drugs. And like I say, when we did that one in, uh, a few months, uh, for a few months back during COVID, it really helped uh, those folks that were participating in that. And it's too bad they don't come and, and give us uh, some of their thoughts, but they don't. So anyway, but that's my thoughts on all that. So. Does anybody, uh, let's say you want to start with, Kirk, you want to start with uh, constituent concerns? Do you I, have? I, don't, I don't have any constituent concerns. Okay. Jennifer? Anybody? Yeah, go ahead, Tom. Uh, if, well, I just had, to, <clears throat> had a few issues there, and I think everybody's aware of it, and I think Bryant handled it. We had some road signage issues, and I think you uh, contacted the, the, the Department of Transportation about that. And, uh, again, ongoing things with the flood. Uh, I live out in that area, and so I would you comment? Uh, I asked you earlier about the deadline on the debris pickup. I know we're we're nearing that. Uh, yeah, we we actually through, through uh, our public information officer published that November 29th would be the last day for debris pickup on on private property, getting things to the right of way. Uh, we, we had to put an end date. We're still working with owners, but. Uh, for the most part, we want to be finished on that. Uh, we've now got approval from FEMA to pick up just a handful of uh, sites that are uh, that are in the stream that that FEMA has agreed are, are in imminent danger downstream. So, uh, SDR, the the contractor that that we use, will now pick up about uh, nine or ten sites uh, in in the stream. I think they're going to try to mobilize this week and maybe by. By the end of this week or first of next week, actually have crews in the stream uh, getting debris out. And they'll be working with owners to, for right of entry and things like that. I know that's been a huge concern. If we have another flood event, uh, the debris that's been shuffled around could possibly cause some infrastructure damage to bridges and things of that nature. So they're going to be on that. And, and it's been a, a struggle, quite frankly. We've, we've identified way more than the nine or ten sites that FEMA has approved. We think that there are probably twice that many uh, sites that are, are a danger downstream, but that's the only approval we have now from FEMA. Uh, so we're working through that. We're hoping that we can still make more progress and pick up more sites. Uh, but uh, the, the ones that are really a danger to bridges and things like that, that we're going to try to knock out... Uh, like I said, in the next two weeks. Okay, so if people do have debris that they need picked up, 
they, they can still get it, maybe, Brian, or if? Yes, we set that deadline, but well, we're still working with folks, but yeah. we, we need to get that moved right. sooner than, than later. We're, we're running out of time. The weather is going to dictate it uh, shortly as well. So, okay. if, uh, so should they call, if they do have sites that need to be picked up, maybe we don't know about, because some of these are off the beaten path. Do, do they just call you want to give your number? No, I'm sorry. It's an ongoing joke that I've got the uh, flood hotline. Yeah. Just, just call Brandon. He'll let us know. Uh, they, they can call the, 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 the county uh, uh, debris number uh, that we've published. Uh, let us know. But uh, the, the contractor's still making its rounds, so they're, they're pretty good at finding the sites themselves. But if, if they want to call into our uh, number, uh, we'll certainly put them on the okay. list. Okay. Go ahead, Brandon. I also had one oh. other, Brandon. Uh, excuse me, uh, oh, Mr. Rogers. Thank, thank <laughs> you. Yes, yes. Uh, I did have a constituent concern about taxes, uh, and I contacted Greg, our tax collector, and the threshold for the 65-year-old and, and uh, older tax break is uh, 31900 per year, and that's per the state of North Carolina. That's not something that we uh, fool around with. That number comes from Raleigh and we're bound to that. So if you're 65 and older and you have income uh, 31,900 or less, uh, talk to, to the tax collector about uh, the elderly deduction. So, and I, I did have that and also other questions about uh, some other tax issues, but I think we got those handled. Go ahead, Brandon. <laughs> uh, no, I, do, I don't really have anything other than the flood related stuff as uh, Mr. Moorhead suggested to get many phone calls every week, but I'm glad to be a service. So I joke about it, but uh, you know, that's, that's why I do what I do is trying to help the community that I live in. So it's no problem at all for me. So you can seriously call me if you have anything. Okay, I'll move on. Is there any other constituent concerns? I'll move on to uh, Administrative Agency reports and presentations in the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation update from the North Carolina uh, Development Director George Ivey and the Chief Executive Officer of the Blue Ridge Parkway uh, Foundation, Carolyn Ward. Hey, welcome, George. How are you doing this morning? I'm good, thank you. i make sure I know what I'm doing here. Okay, very good. Good morning to all of you. Thank you for providing time for us to talk. Um, Carolyn Ward sends her regrets. We ended up with a, um, a double booking and um, I'm not sure how you'll take it that you ended up with me, but you've ended up with me. Um, so, um, y'all are very familiar, I think, with the Blue Ridge Parkway. It's on the seal right there for the county, along with the Great Smoky Mountains. Uh, the parkway stretches 469 miles from Waynesboro, Virginia down to Cherokee, about 40 miles or so on the Haywood County border, kind of snaking along the ridge tops. It's kind of hard to count uh, what's in Jackson County and what's in Haywood County sometimes, but um, a pretty good stretch here in Haywood County. Um, but it's a lot more than a road. It is uh, probably the number one tourism driver in the region. Uh, the parkway brings in more visitors in Yellowstone, Grand Canyon, and Yosemite combined. More visitors than Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Uh, there's no entrance fee, which gets to be an issue. Uh, four main entrances, entrances in Haywood County, with the Wagon Road Gap, Beach Gap, uh, Balsam Gap, and Soco Gap. So um, really nice access points for visitors here. <clears throat> As I'm sure many of you know, it's a great haven for biodiversity, especially the southern portion of the parkway. A lot of distinct plant communities. Uh, probably the best known around here would be the spruce fir forests that are on the edges of the mountaintops. Uh, 54 species of mammals, some of those federally listed, especially some rare bats. Um, 159 species of nesting birds, which is quite a few nesting birds, and then a lot more that migrate through probably 200, 250 species of birds that are seen on the parkway in a year. Uh, and there's some Turks cap lilies and a, a barred owl on that slide there. 
The parkway is also a site for living, uh, sort of living museum for culture and history. And that's more so, I think, as you get further north on the parkway, where it's a little bit more agricultural um, and not as mountainous. This is the Moses Cone Estate in Flat Top Manor, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Probably the, one of the closest um, historic sites here would be Buck Spring Lodge up at Mount Pisgah, which was the Vanderbilt's little uh, rural retreat. 14 visitor centers on the parkway, the closest one to Haywood County. Um, you do have the Asheville Visitor Center, certainly, and then Water Rock Knob, um, as a crow flies, is only like, a, you know, 100 yards from Haywood County, but it takes a little bit longer to drive. Um, and that is the Puckett Cabin near Hillsville, Virginia there, one of uh, nearly 100 historic buildings on the parkway. The parkway, in reality, is pretty thin. There's places it's only 100 yards wide. And so um, that means that it is very long, very thin, has a lot of neighbors, runs through 29 counties, uh, 12 of those in Virginia, 17 in North Carolina, uh, 281 overlooks, official overlooks, and then probably uh, closer to 900 roadside vistas where people are driving along and looking, but hopefully keeping an eye on the road, too. Uh, and then a total of 4,000 visitors, more than 4,000 visitors, and that's a lot more true. Most of those visitors are on those rural lands as you get into Virginia. Not so much down here, where we have a lot of Pisgah National Forest lands um, bordering the parkway. Uh, most of all, and I think uh, a key theme for us, is that it's an economic engine for the local communities. Uh, the parkway had over 14 million visitors last year, despite, you know, the COVID year and some shutdowns of certain sections of the parkway. Um, and that was the most of any national park unit in the country. Uh, the estimate of the local impact, and this is for all the communities within 50 miles of the parkway, is about $1.3 billion of spending. And that supports roughly 15,500 jobs up and down the parkway. Um, a lot of those are more directly in the tourism businesses, um, but then some are, are less direct um, in, you know, construction and other things like that that support the, the tourism industry. Threats to the parkway. Um, it's hard to get around the fact that the parkway is not funded like it used to be uh, from a federal standpoint. The, the parkway staff is at about 70% uh, of where it used to be. Uh, the funding has not grown much, uh, inflation adjusted over the years. That has led to delayed road maintenance, chip and seal uh, as a sort of short-term measure. A lot of overgrown overlooks, the no-look overlooks that you get to, like at Soco Gap, you get there and the trees are 30 to 40 feet tall. That's all you see. Uh, less protection for natural resources. There's still uh, poaching of resources up on the parkway. Everything from witch hazel bark to uh, ramps and ginseng and, and other odd things. Um, shuttered buildings, this was the, the Bluffs um, restaurant or lodge, Can't, I'm not even sure. Um, and again, Moses Cone Estate, you can see the, how Flat Top Manor is just crumbling to pieces there. So it's about a $500,000 um, backlog of maintenance needs. And um, really, as that decay sets in, it impacts visitors. So while the parkway had 14 million visitors last year. Around 2002 or 2003, the parkway had 21 million visitors, so 50% more. And that was when funding was better, the, the scenic views were better, and the scenic views are something that visitors cite, uh, about 92% of visitors cite the scenic views as the reason that they come. So um, there's a, definitely a, sort of a domino effect that happens in all of this. So the parkway, the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation was founded in 1997 to help bring in private resources to help address some of these issues, not to pave the road or fix the plumbing necessarily, but to do some of the work um, on the visitor interface, especially the historic sites, the um, natural resources, uh, recreational resources. Um, and the, as some of you know, Halk Medford, a Haywood County native, founded the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation. Ken Wilson, former uh, publisher of The Mountaineer, was one of the early board chairs. So uh, the foundation has very strong Haywood County roots. We have raised over $18 million, actually provided more than $18 million to the parkway 
um, during that time for a lot of different things. Um, one of the major themes that we fund is cultural and historical preservation. This is uh, Mabry Mill, that some people call the most photographed part of the parkway, though I'm not sure if that's true. Um, but uh, restoring the old mill wheel there, among many uh, historic preservation projects that we've done. This is uh, just a little glimpse of the work at the Flat Top Manor that we uh, helped fund in the last two years. Um, you can see the, just the horrible decay in, in that image and then the, uh, a picture of the restored building um, that just finished up um, just a couple of weeks ago. It looks like a brand new building and it's, uh, it was actually built in 1902 to 1903. Um, it was looking its age two years ago, but now it's looking really great. Uh, and that was uh, about one-third Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation money, uh, and then the Park Service came in and matched the other two-thirds. So a great way that we, um, just like Southwestern Commission, can take money and leverage it, we can um, leverage those funds as well. Uh, protecting natural resources, everything from wildlife cameras to help assess um, where wildlife is or, and isn't, and what else may show up from wild boars to dogs and other things like that. Uh, wildflower work, uh, a lot of work protecting some of the rare lichens and other species up in those spruce fir forests that are very popular for visitors and you don't necessarily want the visitors trampling on all that. Uh, this would be a good example of that where uh, this is Rough Ridge Trail up uh, near Grandfather Mountain. Uh, where people were scrambling over the rocks. It uh, wasn't really great for visitors or for the, the rare species there, putting in a pretty substantial um, uh, set of stairs and boardwalking it and really making it a much better um, experience for everyone involved, protecting the natural resources as well. There are about 369 miles of trail on the parkway and then they connect to thousands more miles uh, on national forest lands and other local lands. Uh, this is a trail project up at Craggy. Uh, we can see just taking a, an eroding ditch and putting in stair steps and other things to, to stem the erosion there. As I mentioned, view shed restoration is a big issue, a big concern for us. The foundation got started with uh, view shed restoration probably 10 or 15 years ago. Um, Lynn Collins, the Haywood County TDA, have actually done quite a bit to help fund some of the work here in Haywood County on view shed restoration. We have a major initiative right now called Trails and Views Forever where we are bringing in private resources to help fund that. Most of that work gets done in March or so, which is um, a good time of year in terms of natural resources. The trees don't have leaves on them, but also don't have bats in them. Um, so most of that work gets done um, late winter um, for you know, things bud out. Um, but it's a, it's a tremendous need um, up and down the parkway. And, and we've been making good progress, I think. Uh, graveyard fields, a very popular spot for people in Haywood County. Um, the work that was done there probably about 10 or 15 years ago, uh, expanding the parking lot, putting in the, the restroom facilities, uh, improving the trails, uh, the steps down to the lower falls there, uh, the signage, all of that was um, funded in part by Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation donors as well as um, DOT funds, US DOT funds. We also fund a lot of education and outreach to help the, the next generation, anything from indoor exhibits to outdoor exhibits to brochures. <clears throat> we recently completed a, a large set of improvements to the exhibits up at Water Rock Knob. Um, for better or worse, it's closed until April, so you can't see them until then at this point. But um, again, focused on the natural resources here. There's also um, one panel on a uh, Cherokee creation story. Um, but um, if you had been there previously, the exhibit on Elks was basically um, a bunch of photos that had been laminated and stuck to a um, a board, um, not the fanciest thing in the world. Uh, so the, some very nice improvements there. Uh, but we do a lot more than fundraising. We operate the Blue Ridge Music Center near Galax, Virginia, which is a, a great location uh, to hear both traditional mountain music and some of the up and coming newer acts. Uh, we have uh, restored the Bluffs restaurant, which used to be the Bluffs 
coffee shop near Sparta. Um, both the lodge and the restaurant closed in 2010 when there was no uh, concessioner bidding on either. And um, they uh, <clears throat> hosted only mold um, for the next few years, but we raised about a million dollars for that project and uh, restored it to look just like it was uh, when it opened in 1949, or as close as we could. And uh, we actually uh, leased that through a historic lease from the Park Service and have uh, a, a restaurant operator in there. We don't know how to make fried chicken, but, but they do. So <laughs> we, um, we, we know how to restore a building and, and fund that. But um, just another example of trying to bring back some of the economic uh, benefits of the parkway. Um, <clears throat> one of the things on the previous slide was the Kids in Parks logo and just wanted to go in a little more depth because we just added the first Kids in Parks track trail in Haywood County at the uh, Nature Trail Disc Golf Course at the Community College. So Kids in Parks started uh, probably 12 years ago as an effort to really get kids outdoors and active again with a lot of concern about kids just wanting to be on their smartphones all the time. And so it began with a trail on the parkway at the Asheville Visitor Center, expanded to seven sites on the parkway. Then a lot of people were like, hey, how do we get on, on this? And so it's now um, stretches across 15 states in Washington, D.C., about 230 official trails. And we're now working on ways uh, to basically make every trail a track trail to encourage kids to get outside. So if it were like the Waynesville Rec Park or you know, something local, Canton, um, they could still use some of the, the, um, the technology that's in there to encourage kids to get out and explore. Um, so this is our first collaboration in Haywood County, again funded through the TDA uh, with a lot of support from the community college. We'd love to have more, more than one trail that they're actually much more effective when there's a cluster of track trails than having one just on its own. But uh, we're, we're proud that we've been able to, to stick a flag in the ground here, so to speak. We ask for money a lot. Don't worry, I'm not asking for money today. Um, we have about 3,000 donors, donor households every year, foundations, businesses, a lot of individuals. The license plates, um, thank you to anyone and everyone who has a license plate in the Canton and Waynesville Tag offices. That brings in over a half million a year, very steady income for the parkway, and great advertising too. We write a lot of grant proposals, um, federal, state, local, private, um, corporate, a little bit of everything. We have some special events. Sometimes uh, companies like Mass General Store will offer proceeds. Um, you know, one weekend a year, they'll share their profits with us. Um, so we raise money however we can, pretty much. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> um, it's more than money, though. Gifts of time, volunteers make a big difference. Some volunteers work directly for the foundation. A lot uh, work for the parkway, doing everything from painting signs to um, picking up trash to working on trails. I believe this was a group from UNC Asheville a, a couple years ago. Um, and then partnerships. I really want to focus on this to kind of transition to the next thing. But this is um, a very collaborative effort where um, locally here in Haywood County there's a lot of concern about people getting lost in the wilderness as they get off the parkway. Again, the parkway is pretty thin and so pretty soon off the parkway, like you're in the graveyard fields parking lot, but you're looking down on forest service land. Mm -hmm. Those trails are forest service land. Um, the wilderness is forest service land. Um, so these uh, signs were jointly developed with the forest service and a lot of local partners, um, which you can see there, including Haywood County Emergency Services. You'll note there's the National Park Service is not on this list. Um, and I think that's important to recognize that the foundation does not sit at the parkway boundary and look in at the road. We like to be at, on the top of the parkway looking out, seeing those relationships, seeing how the parkway can impact local communities for better or worse, hopefully turn those worse into better. Um, so this is a great joint project. Uh, 22 signs were installed and um, there was a 50% reduction in search and rescue calls between the year before the signs and the year after. So that's to me a great example, reducing the cost and burden of those lost visitors, um, making sure visitors have a better experience of course, 
uh, it can be a life safety issue as well. So um, I think that's just a great, uh, a great example of how we can work together uh, and make a lot of great things happen. And so we are starting to do a lot more in terms of um, reaching out to the communities beyond the parkway, um, looking at those 29 counties and hundreds of towns and trying to figure out how can we partner more often. And so we, um, <clears throat> there's a term called gateway communities for a lot of national parks. And you might think of something like Gatlinburg as a gateway community because it's just like right there on the doorstep of Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Um, but we're thinking a little more broadly at, at sort of those 29 counties, rural areas. It could be a rural, you know, a bed and breakfast in a rural area as well as a, a, a down, vibrant downtown like Waynesville. Um, and so we're, we've gotten started uh, first in Virginia, coming down in North Carolina. And the basic process of this is to examine the parkway as a community asset, look at the strengths within a community as well as between communities, where it could be that like one county has one great trout fishing stream and another county has eight, but like we could probably work together and, um, and promote all of those as one. Um, identify gaps to fill to get more diverse, more abundant visitors, um, encouraging them to stay longer. Addressing both economic, uh, sort of short-term opportunities and long-term. Um, and then, as well as entrepreneurship, there's a great and growing outdoor recreation business industry in Western North Carolina, um, where you have you know, companies like Sylvan Sport, um, Eno, a lot of others around here that are really Kitspo. Um, this region is really getting to be known for its outdoor recreation industry. Um, and there are, I think, more opportunities for that. Um, so we you know, ultimately want to grow those beneficial impacts and build those partnerships. So what we're doing in North Carolina um, is a, some initial outreach through the councils of government, especially in some of the counties that we don't know as well. Um, they're helping us identify key contact people for each county to help us kind of work through. And I certainly welcome your suggestions here today. Um, where we then have a, a contact list for each county that includes you know, tourism folks, economic development folks, um, other nonprofits that may be you know, logical partners, uh, and other just sort of community leaders who may not have any official title but um, are key people to make things happen. Um, and then sending out a survey to, to really understand local opinions, local thoughts. Um, this process in Virginia, nearly half the people identified responded, which is excellent. Um, and then we, we get that information back and talk about kind of what the kind of priority areas may be, and then we want to really get in, dig in, and, and figure out what those local solutions are. We don't really want to um, pre-populate that. We want that to be a very organic thing where the local community says, this is what we need. So if it's search and rescue, great. If it's fly fishing, Great. Um, if it's something else we haven't thought of, that's great too. Um, so that's the kind of stuff we want to do. <clears throat> the Haywood County, the work in Haywood County and these southern counties will be, um, obviously it'll be into next year before we really get going. It's a little hard to do things in December, but um, we'd really love to be, um, have a very active process here in Haywood County. Um, and so whether it's working on that big gateway initiative or a kids and parks uh, hiking trails, um, license plates, um, whatever we can do together. We just love the opportunity to partner together. I think um, Kirk may have shared with you these little um, postcards on some of our economic impact, but I think that's really what it's all about, just trying to bring, um, bring those tourists in, making sure that you know, Haywood County, other counties really benefit from those visitors, aren't just um, paying for a lot of search and rescue work. So, um, so that's a brief overview of what we've been up to and what we have coming up. Uh, I welcome questions, comments, suggestions, or what have you. Do you know how many people visited the Blue Ridge Parkway in recent years or last year? Do you know those numbers? George, yep. I don't know that I gave, I, I think I had that at my office, but I don't know if I provided them with that sheet. They okay. don't want to see that I, sheet. Yeah, I have some extras of these. Because that, that, that answers that question along with, with some other questions. Is, oh, okay. Is why. Yeah, and, and actually, th th that's kind of impressive in regards to the numbers. And in, in one of the TDA meetings, we were discussing the, the use of funds, and I was going to ask George, George, if, if the county or the TDA wanted to um, 
provide funds specifically for uh, view shed restoration or clearing the overlooks, is that possible to do that? Because that's one of my main concerns. Mm -hmm. It's what I see when I go on the parkway. And of course, you, you mm -hmm. had noted that visitors um, have cited that as, a, as an issue as well. And, it, and it's an sure. issue that if I went up on the parkway and I couldn't see and it said mm -hmm. overlook, I won't come back. And, right. and I think that's really important to preserve that. Very true. Um, and just to, uh, for Mr. Long, uh, the visitation has ranged from 14 million to 21 million over the last 20 years. Um, it's been about uh, 15 and a half average over the last 15 years. Um, I know because I had to put in that statistic for a grant proposal. Um, but it's about 15 million in uh, 2019, 14 million last year, and we're expecting it to be back above 15 million this year. Um, and for Mr. Kirkpatrick, um, yes, we, we receive donations, everything from unrestricted to very restricted, um, where someone is like, I, I want this spent in Dalton Park on trails. And we respect that, and we, we work with the Park Service to do that. Um, sometimes we will take a project on ourselves directly when the Park Service can't do it, because we have a little, we have some freedom to do things, but not, certainly not all. We can't just go in and cut down trees. Um, but yeah, um, you know, welcome the opportunity to work on Haywood County specific work. Um, we do have the, um, we're replacing the observation platform atop Mount Pisgah um, next year. We actually have pretty good amount of funding in place for that and Carolina Mountain Club is actually going to do the work, provide the volunteers uh, along with the Forest Service. Um, but yeah, working on view sheds or working on trails, um, there's a little bit of a lag time working with the park service and then also just coordinating because um, when you on those um, overlook clearings they there is a process they do have to make sure you know in terms of rare species and, and all of that and, they, and a lot of that ma when it's major work they really have to do it volunteers can usually come in and kind of maintain once that's you know established and where it's just you know one or two years growth, um, but when it's major work uh, on big trees, it takes a while. Um, but yeah, we'd be we'd be happy to work, you know, either directly with y'all or through the Park Service to to make things happen and keep the money local. Right. We actually also have a local. Um, there's a private foundation that's given us ten thousand dollars a year. To, same general idea, keep it local, um, and so we're we're working on that. How many access points do we have in Haywood County to the parkway? Um, the main access points would be four Wagon Road Gap near Pisgah Inn, uh, Beach Gap near Devil's Courthouse, Balsam Gap, and Soco Gap. Um, there's a few trails, there's a little bit of, you know, there's a couple of back roads, dirt roads you can kind of access, but they aren't really well known. Mm -hmm. So, and then you, you have the Hintuga Road offshoot, but that's sort of one way once once you get too far on that so tremendous asset to our county sure. George you have any idea about you know the 14 million applies to the whole Blue Ridge Parkway do you have any idea of the number of visitors that attributes to Haywood County I'd have to go see what the there are some um, breakouts where they do have strips at particular exits and entrances. Um, let me look that up. I would imagine one of these four would have that um, and could probably get you some some idea. <coughs> it may not be perfect. That's all right. If it, it it's like, have to be. If it's the balsam exit entrance, they could be going to Jackson County or Haywood County. Sure. And so it ends up being a little bit of guesswork. Right. So. Any other questions? What amazes me is, uh, and I see it here on the postcard as well, that Yellowstone, Yosemite, and uh, the Grand Canyon combined don't have as much visitors as we do. That is correct. It's true. That's, and some of that is because they're in rural areas, and so they don't have a, an Atlanta or a Charlotte to drive um, as part of it. They're certainly iconic. Not as many people internationally would know of the Blue Ridge Parkway compared to a Yellowstone. Um, so they, they tend to have a lot more international visitors as well, um, which is a, 
can be a blessing or a curse. It meant that the Blue Ridge Parkway held steady um, while a lot of those other parks that rely on a lot of international visitors had a much greater impact during uh, COVID and, and various flight restrictions. Well, it's, it's a great asset for our county. My, my family keeps me on the go. We were up at the Moses Cone uh, Manor uh, over Thanksgiving. My daughter yeah. lives up, up toward Blowing Rock, son-in-law. They're in school up there. But it, it is a magnificent place if no one's ever experienced the Benco Viaduct and on up toward Blowing mm -hmm. Rock and experience that. That uh, acreage up there, they got to build a couple of lakes, you hiking trails all over the place. And the viewing platform on Mount Pisgah does need some attention. Uh, we were up there yes, not sir. long ago, and uh, so I look forward to seeing that. So it is a great we, asset for our county. Too. I know I've got a son that's a little bit hard to impress, and we went out to Yellowstone and saw all that, and went about 16 states and 5,000 some miles driving. and we came back up I 40, and he. He said, Dad, these are the beautiful mountains I've, I've seen since we left <laughs> on this whole trip, <laughs> you know, right here at home. So sometimes we take for granted, that, you know, what mm -hmm. we have because we live here. But uh, True. it's a great asset. Thank you. I also wanted to ask uh, if I heard you right, uh, you raise over a half a million dollars through the tags. Is that correct? Every year. Wow. That's, that's pretty that's impressive. A, so if anybody's uh, listening, go buy some tags, right? Please do, please do. We, we're trying to get one going in Virginia, and it's a, uh, it's a bit of a slow process to get them going. But yeah, it's, a, it's tremendous. It's the top tag in the state. It's also available for motorcycles, because you know, a lot of motorcyclists love riding the parkway as well. So. Yeah, I figured it would raise some money, but raising that much was a little, little uh, shocking or amazing, so that's good. Yeah, we're very, uh, we keep an eye on it in Raleigh, where they <laughs> make a lot of decisions about license plates. Yeah. So. Good. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Anything else? else? Okay. Well, okay, you'll be you hearing much. more from us. Really appreciate the time and your interest. And um, feel free to contact us anytime if you have concerns. If you see an opportunity for us to work together. So, thank you for your time. Thank you. Right, thanks for coming out today, George. Our next order of business is a discussion adjustment to the agenda. Um, I don't have any adjustment to the agenda, but I do have a discussion on the list of boards on which commissioners serve, and we want to consider any assignments. Um, I think that's in our packet. I think, Jen, you were having trouble making one of them. Yeah, yeah, I have a standing conflict for the Juvenile Crime Prevention Council. They meet the first Wednesday of each month, and I have another standing appointment on the first Wednesday as well. So, um, I've got commission, the Southwest Commission, that board that I they've, they've got me appointed to. If you want to switch with, I can switch that with you. Sure. Um, and what that is, is it's every other month, I think. They, they put out a schedule. And actually, all, all elected officials can go to that. But I was just kind of the appointee for our board to go. I know Tommy goes with me a lot, and Bryant goes some. Uh, but all of you can go. They usually have a, well, during COVID, they didn't. But usually, they have a meal and then a program. Yeah, I've been on some of their Zoom calls. They did, oh, there was you? a Zoom meeting for oh, a while. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, OK. Yeah. So if you want to, we'll just sure. swap, swap that one out. So we, to, is that okay with everybody? That's fine with me. Then that way we'll have a, with the JCPC, we'll have, I'll, I'll do that. They're, it's a very valuable board and I yeah. feel like that it, somebody definitely needs to be serving there. Yeah, I appreciate you pointing that out and stuff. So. Thank you. Okay, we'll vote on that in the next meeting. We'll vote on these uh, at the next meeting. If that's, is every, every, everything else okay with everybody? Yeah, I'm good. I, there's a couple things. The, the Downtown Waynesville Association, it's kind of in limbo. The town has taken that back over, and I'm not, I'm not certain whether, I, if I'm notified, I'll go to a board meeting, but I just wanted to let you know that. And then the uh, Haywood Regional Medical Center Hospital Authority is no longer in existence either. I, I am on the Haywood Health uh, Haywood Health Foundation, though, and that's not listed on here. Is that a board appointment? I don't know if it is or not. <laughs> we can check into that. So. 
to check into that. I, I Tracy. think it is. I think because of the. Oh, we did. The, she says uh, it is. Yeah. Yeah, I think because of the agreement we have that, that that's the reason I'm on that. Oh, board. okay. So we just need to take TDA off. I mean, I think to, I think just replace Haywood Regional Medical Center Hospital Authority with Haywood Health Foundation. Isn't that what it is? Hey, with Healthcare Foundation. The, or the downtown Waynesville board it, it goes away. I I, guess. I, well, I, I would probably just leave it on there for right now. I mean, it's a okay. political limbo. Yeah. Right. You're right. Okay. Do I have anything else? We'll, we'll take care of that at our next meeting then. Okay. Well, I don't have any. Does anybody have any other discussion or adjustment to the agenda? And we'll move on to uh, the consent agenda. Does anybody have any questions about any of the items on the consent agenda this morning? And here now, I'll entertain the motion. We approve the consent agenda as presented. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, any, any discussion at all? All those in favor say aye. Uh, uh, okay, you want to post. <clears throat> okay, we'll move on to our next order of business is regular agenda. The first item is to request approval to award a bid for the purchase of the following nine feet county vehicles from the bidder stated below in the amount of $255,923.82 to be paid from fiscal year 2022 budgeted funds. Go ahead, Chris. Good morning, Chairman, Commissioners. I'm here to request the approval to purchase those nine vehicles as stated. We sent out an RFB in October to nine different dealerships, um, local, the three local in Haywood County and others around Western North Carolina, even as far as Raleigh. So uh, we received three bids back. Uh, you will see the breakout um, as I have listed for the awards, uh, several to Ken Wilson Ford several to Taylor Motor Company. Those were the only two local in-county bidders. So with, um, with that, and I'd, I'd like to answer questions. If you'd like me to read it all, I will, but I'm not sure how much detail you want me to state. We need to read it, you think, Tracy? Uh, yeah. Because yeah. it's, it's in our agenda pack. I don't think you need to do that. Does anybody have any questions about any of the vehicles? I'm just glad that we have the, uh, the local companies that are, that are obtaining these bids. And, you know, it's, been a lot, it's been difficult to, to uh, communicate to the community the fact that they have to, you know, we have to go through a bid process. We can't just award things to local uh, businesses, but I think they've caught on, and I've seen more and more uh, local businesses obtaining these bids now. Two of the three local dealerships bid and will be awarded vehicles. The auto star of Waynesville chose not to provide a bid. Did they give you any indication on um, inventory and availability? Well, I haven't gotten to that yet. Okay. There is a caveat you will see in your agenda package that there's no guarantee of delivery prior to <laughs> July 1st. Um, everyone thinks they can get this, but most of them are 30 weeks out from the date of order. So if we get everything processed this week, award the bid, purchase orders for probably 30 weeks to get those. What does that do to our county vehicle fleet? I mean, are we in desperate need to replace these or will we be able to hang on till mid-2022? We're, we're obviously in need. Um, what we would hope to do is piece some things together to get us by until we can receive these. If we go beyond <coughs> July 1, we'd like to uh, still continue to, to attempt to get these vehicles in even if we have to reappropriate funds for out of the fund balance after July 1. Um, I don't see next year being any easier to get vehicles. I've recently traded vehicles and it was no easy feat, I will say that. <laughs> Very difficult. It, it is difficult. One of the things that, that you were gracious enough to do for us is allow us to order the 13 Dodge Chargers for the Sheriff's Office early on. We found the 21 2021 models on the lot. Uh, you can't buy a pursuit ready Dodge Charger now. 
Um, so we were fortunate to do that, and we have those um, proposed for delivery after the first of the year. Is there any other questions? Hey, can I I'll entertain a motion we approve item one of the regular agenda? So moved. Second. 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 Okay. Any discussion at all? All in favor say aye. 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 So one opposed. That's unanimous. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Chris. Thank you. And the, the second item of the regular agenda is to request approval of budget amendment for public safety of thirty three thousand five hundred and nineteen dollars. <laughs> To appropriate seized drug forfeiture funds from fund balanced for the purchase of a 2021 Dodge Durango from Performance Auto Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram. And we have our Chief Deputy Jeff Haynes here this morning. Welcome, Jeff. Good morning, Chairman and Commissioners. Uh, before you today, I'm requesting an approval, or the Sheriff's Office is requesting approval of, of a budget amendment in the amount of $33,519 appropriating seized drug forfeiture. Uh, funds uh, from the fund balance for the purchase of a 2021 Dodge Durango from Performance Automotive Chrysler Dodge uh, Jeep and Ram, which is in uh, is on the North Carolina Sheriff's uh, Association vehicle procurement list, uh, but following on the heels of, of Mr. Boyd as well too. The the inventory is so thin right now. Uh, that uh, none of these ve or the vehicles that were available statewide, this is a, the only one that was actually sitting available, and it was evidently an over order from another agency and, uh, at some point that they had left, but it is, uh, it's a brand new vehicle and uh, is available currently at Performance Dodge. Uh, and uh, we're requesting $33,000 to be pulled from drug, drug asset forfeiture money to be able to purchase that. Does anybody have any questions about the item two? I, I just have a question. How does that, is that drug seizure money from Haywood County or is that something that is, mm -hmm. it is? It, uh, what it is, is it, it comes from the, uh, from the federal government. There's a percentage depending on how the asset mm -hmm. forfeiture occurs. Mm -hmm. if, it, if it is seized back through the federal government, the U.S. Marshals Service has an 80%, it's an 80-20 split. They take 20% for cost of doing business, 80% comes back to the county. Uh, if it's seized from the uh, from the state side, it goes strictly back to the school system. So, depending on which direction it goes through the court system, which seizure uh, direction it goes, either state or federal government, depends on the percentage that comes back to the county. This particular group, and uh, uh, the finance director can uh, can correct me if I'm wrong. This particular fund comes strictly from the federal government. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I'll entertain a motion. We approve item two of the regular agenda. So moved. Second. Second. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Anyone opposed? Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Okay. And then uh, the next uh, item is to request approval of budget amendment for county purchases, repairs, and maintenance of $114,588 to appropriate funds from fund balance and approval of Mission Critical Partners LLC contract in the amount of $114,588 for the Public Safety Radio Tower Design Consulting Services for Phase 1 of the Lake Logan Area Radio Tower Project and authorization for the county manager to execute all required documentation pertaining to said contract. We have our IT Director Joey Webb here. Welcome, Joey. Good morning. Good morning. Um, just a quick update on the public safety radio project. The first phase, which you guys are aware of, that we've been working on for probably a couple of years now, um, is almost totally complete. They're doing some final testing and tuning. All the equipment is in place. Um, so we're working on that and doing some testing, and, and preliminarily it's looking really good. Uh, the one thing for those that were involved in some of those meetings early on that we knew was we still had a dead spot in the greater Lake Logan Bethel area. Uh, so this is the first phase of a tower to correct that dead spot. Um, we're looking at a couple of different properties and uh, mission critical partners um, actually worked with us to help design the 911 center about six years ago and the new tower that's there at the sheriff's office that came with it. So uh, we had a really good experience with them and their engineers and the design there. So uh, we're asking to uh, engage them again 
and to uh, start the planning process to build this new tower. We expect the engineering and planning to take the better part of the winter, um, and we're hoping that that'll time out where we'll be ready to break ground when warm weather comes back around. Do you think you'll break ground when? In the spring. Spring. Anybody got any questions? <laughs> I think you've checked around. And this saves a lot of money from the other provider we were looking at. So yeah, it saves some money anyway. No, no questions. Just glad to see us moving forward on yeah. it. You know, I get a lot of calls from this as well, and it is a much needed <laughs> service in that area. So, thank you for what you're doing. And I know, like Kevin said, we're we're going to save some money and hopefully get that that community better communication. So, thank you. Okay, I'll entertain a motion. We approve item three of the regular agenda. So moved. Second. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 You want opposed? Okay, it's unanimous. Thank you, Thank you, Joey. Our next order of business is appointments, and we have our county manager, Brian Moorhead, to describe that. Now, item one. Go ahead, Brian. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you'll remember from uh, Shelley Foreman's last presentation about by uh, expanding out of the region, even over as far east as Vance County. Uh, before, they've had a uh, um, county commissioner advisory board. But uh, because of their, their size, they're going to more of a, a regional board uh, uh, design. Uh, I've sat on that board, uh, Commissioner Best as well. But in the new design, uh, Ira Dove has sat on, on the VIA board before. And I think he would be a better fit in my place on this because especially with uh, Medicaid transformation and all of the, the services VIA works with the health department and social services, his expertise would be better than mine, and uh, commissioner is required, and Commissioner Best has agreed to sit on that board. Any, any other discussion on that? I'll entertain a motion. We approve item one of appointments. So moved. For a second. Right. Okay, any discussion at all? All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, it's unanimous. Okay, our next order of business is closed session. And um, we have two items. Uh, attorney client is 143-318-11A3, and economic development is 143-318-11A4. I'll entertain a motion. We go into closed session. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. We'll be in closed session when we enter the uh, commissioner's meeting room in the back.
Our next meeting, regular meeting, we'll just have a regular meeting, so. Yes, it'll be, it'll be the one before Christmas. Okay, I'll entertain a motion we adjourn. So moved. Second. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Okay, we're adjourned. Thank you.